Hollywood actors are known for being degenerates of all kinds, losers, creeps, and you know, Latina guyats. But even the establishment shuddered when faced with a straight up absolute freak. From being in the widely acclaimed and personally esteemed The Social Network, which is like my favorite movie probably of all time, to making waves with his lead role in Call Me By Your Name, and ultimately the leak of his private messages and details, which included his predilection for cannibalism, today we'll be talking about the rise and fall of Army Hammer. Someone who you heard a lot about in Hollywood just a few years ago and it seemed like he was really next up, and now you might never hear from again. Born on the 28th of August, 1986 in the city of Santa Monica in Los Angeles County, California. Before we actually get to Army himself, we have to address the fact that he has an unusual ancestry. For starters, his great-great-grandfather on his father's side was a Ukrainian Jewish emigre to America named Julius Hammer, a medical practitioner who ran five drugstores in the Bronx. This may sound kind of mundane and commonplace, but I shouldn't neglect to mention that Julius used his drugstores to launder money from illegal sales of smuggled diamonds for none other than the Soviet Union. Kind of funny given his last name. You know, the whole hammer and sickle thing? I'm clever, I know. Not only that, but he was pivotal in the founding of the Communist Party in the United States. His passion for the party and its symbolism was so great that he decided to name his son Armand Hammer. Armand, who is Army's great-grandfather and the person from whom his name was derived, was a business magnate who ran the multi-billion dollar company Occidental Petroleum for a number of years. Much like his father, he was closely tied to the Soviet Union and supported them in a number of ways, though mostly financially rather than outright politically. Oddly enough, Armand had nothing to do with founding the brand of baking soda products, Arm and Hammer, though he did own stock in it. Eventually, Armand met Olga von Root, a baroness and a daughter of a Tsarist general, and with her, he had Julian Hammer, who in turn had Michael Hammer, Army's father. Besides his work at his grandfather's company, Michael also worked with securities and investment banking. While not as financially successful as his predecessors by any stretch of the imagination, Michael also owned multiple companies, one of which was his very own film and television production company. Pretty foreboding, considering his son became a movie star. Eventually, Michael married Drew Ann Mobley, the daughter of a real estate developer and banker, and she herself was a loan officer at a bank. The couple's combined income sources gave Army and his younger brother, Victor, a pretty cushy childhood. For the first seven years of his life, he lived with his family in Highland Park, a township in Dallas, Texas that's most highly populated by the financially well-off, to put it mildly, considering the median household income there is three times the country's. According to Army himself, when he was seven years old, his father watched the Tom Cruise movie The Firm, which included in its plot allusions to the tax haven status of the Caribbean region. As someone who was extremely preoccupied with keeping as much of his money out of the federal government's coffers as possible, his father became so entranced with the concept that he decided it was time for the family to move to the Cayman Islands, where they lived for the next five years. During this time, his father, a convert to Christianity, started a non-profit Christian radio station and founded a school called the Grace Christian Academy, which Army himself attended. Whenever Army wasn't at school, he spent most of his free time swimming, fishing, and a plethora of other water-related activities to the degree that he caught ringworm a couple of times due to rarely wearing shoes. When he turned 12, his family resettled to LA. But before that happened, when he was 11, Army showed the very first signs of an interest in an acting career. He had dreams of actually being Macaulay Culkin in Home Alone. As he himself said in an interview, I saw the movie Home Alone with Macaulay Culkin and I went to sleep that night and I had a dream that I was the kid in the movie. But it wasn't like I'm the kid in the Home Alone movie. I felt like I was acting in the Home Alone movie. I woke up the next morning and I was like, that's awesome. I got a BB gun. I got a blowtorch. I got to shoot bad guys. This acting thing is so awesome. The next morning I was sitting with my parents at breakfast saying, I think I want to be an actor. My mom goes, well, first of all, I'm not going to drive you around to auditions and sit in traffic and rush hour for you to get rejected your entire childhood. That's not fair. There are things in this business that no 13 year old should ever see. If you want to do this when you become an adult, we can't stop you. That's your prerogative. But as of right now, we're going to say we're not going to raise a child in Hollywood. It's just not going to happen. That being said, it was quite convenient for him that when he left the Cayman Islands, he went to Los Angeles of all places, literally the home of Hollywood. In LA, he attended Los Angeles Baptist School, where he made his debut on stage as Rooster Hannigan in a sixth grade production of the play Annie. However, his interest in theater and acting was not well received, especially by other students, who already picked on Army for, at the time, being overweight and having to wear braces and headgear for his overbite. And I, you know, started to put on a little weight and then I had to wear like braces and headgear and like I had an overbite and it was, it was just, it was a bad combination of everything. And kids in junior high latched onto it and really noticed. And then, uh, you know, I, I was like, uh, there probably wasn't a night in sixth or seventh grade where I wasn't, you know, 
fighting tears while going to sleep, you know? Overall, though, his family and the small private Christian school community he attended at the time weren't particularly keen on Army's interests. He felt caged and consequently became a very rebellious teenager. His favorite movie at the time was Fight Club, a movie from the same director as The Social Network, which he would later act in. Shout out David Fincher, you're the GOAT. Army began acting out in whatever way he could, including in self-admittedly stupid ways. In eighth grade, he retells the tale of how he became a Playboy magazine distributor, saying, I almost got kicked out of eighth grade for selling Playboy. Me and this guy had a ring where we'd bring magazines packaged with a bottle of lotion to school. Brilliant business plan, wasn't it? And sell them to kids for $20. Then I got called into a teacher's office. He said, I've heard you're bringing in these nudie magazines. I said, nope, not me. He went, so you wouldn't mind if we checked your locker? Which he then went and did. We'd stash the actual magazines in bushes by the school, but there was a ton of lotion in the locker. All he could say was, why do you have so much lotion? I said, I get dry hands. He didn't get away with everything though, as he once poured lighter fluid right outside his school and lit it on fire, only to be immediately caught and punished as soon as the school's administration discovered it. But how did they find out it was him who had done it, you may ask? Well, most likely it was due to the facts that he wrote his name out with lighter fluid, and there weren't that many kids named Army to investigate. In the 11th grade, Army dropped out of school and signed with an agent to pursue an acting career, much to the dismay of his family. He describes it as having gone as follows. On my 18th birthday, I was like, okay, I'm an adult now. I want to act. They were like, you're dropping out of high school? No hammer man has ever even dropped out of college without getting an MBA or a PhD. They were hoping I'd forget, and I didn't. I was somewhere with my mom, and someone walked up to me, and they said, have you ever wanted to be an actor? And I was just like, okay, lady, I don't know what you're selling. I'm not going to do a I don't know what this is. No, thank you. She's like, no, just meet a friend of mine who's a casting director. So I went and I met with her friend who's a casting director. And then she introduced me to her friend who was an agent. And that is the agency that I've been signed with. I signed the day I met her and I've been there ever since. Despite successfully beginning the transition into his acting career, he agreed to take college courses at UCLA to appease his parents after they threatened to cut him off if he didn't. But his intentions were clearly to be an actor. It didn't take very long for his ambitions to materialize as within three years of him dropping out of high school, he already got his very first big part in a TV show, Arrested Development. Believe it or not, I only did this because I didn't want you to feel bad about yourself. Hey, Star Door. Hey. He knows you now. While his part is obviously small, it was a good way to start. Over the next couple of years, he made minor appearances in other established TV shows like Desperate Housewives and Veronica Mars. Pretty standard for an acting career in development. Only in 2008, when Army was 22, he got his first part as a lead actor in a proper film. The movie, titled Billy, The Early Years, was a biopic about the Christian televangelist Billy Graham, who Army plays. It's very likely that Army's Baptist background and his family had a hand in getting him involved in the project. While the movie was nominated for an award by a Christian organization, not many people saw it whatsoever. Around the same time, Army was working with the director of Happy Feet and Mad Max, George Miller, not to be confused with the other George Miller. You know, Filthy Frank, that, that guy. George's project was a superhero film titled Justice League Mortal, and Army was going to play Batman. Considering that this was taking place at the same time that Christian Bale delivered what many consider to be the definitive Batman performance, it was a pretty daunting task from the get-go. Hammer praised Bale's performance, but despite his claims that he didn't want to compete or compare their performances, he was giving it his all. Since the movie was going to be shot in Australia, that's where Army was spending most of his time prepping. This included several hours of training with the special forces, with actual guns, and workout regimens so intense that many people vomited. The objective wasn't to become aesthetically good looking, but rather to endure the more grueling elements of shooting the movie. He'd even had his own custom bat suit made and tried out, only to find out that they wouldn't be going forward with the movie, mostly due to the consequences of the writer's strike that was taking place during that time, and the denial of a tax rebate they wanted to get from the Australian government. While it was pretty upsetting that the cancellation happened that far into the lead up to shooting, it didn't slow down Army one bit. In 2009, he made pretty significant appearances in TV shows like Gossip Girl and Reaper, as well as in a few other productions. But even though he was a relatively established TV actor at this point, he wasn't an A-lister when it came to feature films. He describes this period of his career as an uphill battle to get into movies. But not all things were strife, as in 2010, after being introduced to her by LA painter Tyler Ramsey, which happened in 2006, and then beginning to date her in 2008, Army married TV personality Elizabeth Chambers. More specifically, he talked her into marrying him, saying, look, we don't have to do this, we could just go our separate ways, and then one day you'll be 40 and divorced, and we'll run into each other and we'll laugh and go out to dinner and have the same connection and we'll wonder why we wasted all that time or maybe we could just do it now and enjoy the ride him getting together with elizabeth wasn't just the first domino of his meteoric rise but it was also pivotal in saving him as he puts it anyway there's a bird outside my apartment you hear it shut up he's still going mother
Fucker. I definitely feel like my wife rescued me. I was heading down the bachelor path and now I come home and it feels like home. There's no longer leather furniture everywhere. It's nice. I feel that women do save the day in a lot of ways. I feel like men, left to their own devices, can just kind of wander off into whatever path of craziness they so choose. Little did anyone know at the time what exactly this path of craziness was that ARMY was referencing. Just a few months later, ARMY played the pretty prominent role of the Winkleboss twins in the social network. And this could be said to be the moment that he really became a bona fide movie star. Fortunately for him, some of the intense physical training he underwent for the Batman role, which he never got to play, was made useful since the Winkleboss twins were Olympic rowers, and in order to play them, he had to become a pretty good rower himself. His excellent performances earned him an award for Best Supporting Actor, and I personally, like I said, I love this movie, and he was f***ing great in it. He was excellent. He was perfect. Mwah. I love you, Army Hammer. Hollywood's eyes were now on Army, which is a bit ironic since his rise to fame came from playing Harvard students when he himself dropped out of college to be an actor. There was general acclaim for his performance, as well as people being in awe that he was just one person, given how convincingly the twins are played. The illusion was created with another actor, Josh Pence, who acted as a stand-in for one of the twins, and then during post-production, Army was edited into his place. The movie itself was a massive success, and it catapulted Army directly into his next role, J. Edgar. A movie made by Clint Eastwood, starring Leonardo DiCaprio, is the founder of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. Army once again found himself in the shoes of a supporting role as Clyde Tolson. Much like the reception of his role in The Social Network, his stellar acting wasn't the only thing that drew headlines. In a somewhat controversial move, both Hoover and Tolson are depicted as closeted and in love with each other, sharing a kiss in the movie, which was extensively covered by the media. Don't get me wrong, the movie is talked about for a lot of other reasons. For one, it's a Clint Eastwood production, and since that's an increasingly rare event, it was a big deal. And it also starred DiCaprio and was nominated for an Oscar, so it got a lot of attention. However, However, due to the at the time still relatively taboo nature of having a same-sex relationship take center stage, or in this case, center screen, it did a really good job of hogging the spotlight. Part of what attracted all this attention was the fact that the movie was highly fictionalized and none of the gay scenes were ever proven to have actually happened, which raised some controversy. However, Army considered it a safe bet that Tolson was indeed gay since in his application to the FBI, he mentioned having no interest in marrying or being with a woman. Ha! Gay! Clyde Tolson? More like... Gay guy. More like likes men. More like kisses guys. More like, oh my god, are you a guy? Me too. After the sequence of highly attention grabbing milestones in his career, 2012 was a bit of a lull, beginning with a pretty odd occurrence. In January, after celebrating his wedding ceremony, Army was transporting the table decorations from it to San Antonio, Texas, where his wife's bakery was about to open. He drove to Sierra Blanca, where he was suddenly stopped by a police outpost that was searching every vehicle that passed through with a canine unit. Upon inspecting that he was moving wedding decorations, he was almost allowed to pass without a search. But right as he was about to drive away, one of the dogs approached the vehicle and sat down with his paw up, indicating that there was some kind of illegal contraband in the U-Haul. When the cops went through it, they found marijuana and edibles, which landed Army in jail for the night, as at that point, it was still very much illegal in Texas. He recalls that his night in jail wasn't that bad, as his cellmates were pretty sociable and even offered him a few benefits, such as a tattoo and ass weed, meaning weed that was smuggled into the cell via one of their, uh, you know, it's not that it was bad weed, although it, it probably was, but it was in their butt. <coughs> He paid a thousand dollars bond and was allowed to go with relative ease, considering that the law required a person to have at the very least four ounces of the drug in order for a serious charge, and Army possessed a measly .02 ounces. Besides a short movie and a couple of episodes on The Simpsons and American Dad, Army's only proper movie part was that of The Prince in a forgettable early 2010s rendition of the Snow White fable. In late 2012, Army's name was once again being considered to play Batman in a Justice League movie, this time by Warner itself and not any subsidiary. As the Dark Knight trilogy came to its end that same year, they were already eyeing a reboot of the character with another actor, though they ultimately ended up going with Ben Affleck in the 2017 movie. I guess that was kind of a good call, though. Can you imagine Army Hammer and Ezra Miller acting in the same movie? It would be, <laughs> it would be too much for anyone to handle. Before the end of 2012, one last notable event took place, as was retold by the news personality Leanne Tweeden in her Facebook post. I was sitting in my house when I hear an accident tonight. I throw on my shoes and run out of the house to see if I can help. I see it's on my busy corner and run down that way. I run up as a 
a guy is helping an older woman who's 60 ish out of her smashed up car that both airbags deployed in. Now, mind you, it's rush hour at a busy intersection. People are honking at each other, honking at other cars because the one lane is blocked and people can't go through the debris in the open lane fast enough for others. When the guy turns around, who is it? None other than Army Hammer from the social network. He was in the opposite turn lane in his Audi and watched the whole thing go down and got out of his car to help. Even if his career had paused as skyrocketing, his PR had a massive boost from this. 2013 begins and Army is in the lead role in The Lone Ranger, a movie rendition of the radio series of the same name. Along with him, the movie was starred by Johnny Depp, who'd just recently done a Pirates of the Caribbean movie and was still surfing on a good amount of notoriety from it. And you know, it's also Johnny Depp, so what do you expect? The Lone Ranger was also produced by the same guy who had been producing the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, Jeremy Bruckheimer. Because of these connections, ever since The Lone Ranger was announced in the middle of 2011, expectations were high for it to be a spiritual successor, at least quality-wise, to the Pirates series. Unfortunately, these huge expectations for The Lone Ranger went sorely under Matt. Despite the movie's big rollout, it grossed $260 million on a budget of $215, meaning even though it did make ends meet, it wasn't by a comfortable margin. Many critics cited its runtime of two and a half hours as an example of it being poorly executed. Others pointed to the excessive budget and ambition as the root of the issue. Regardless, it just didn't do what it was expected to, and once again, Hammer's career was on shifty grounds. While this was not a downfall, it was somewhat of a limbo, as the rest of 2013 had no significant roles to speak of. But this isn't to say that Army was out of the headlines altogether. In June, he made the mistake of haphazardly talking about his sex life to Playboy magazine in an interview, and with it came the first signs of trouble that eventually severely damaged his career and reared its head. In it, he said, Playboy, you're a guy who has gone on record saying he's obsessed with tying knots and who often carries a rope and a knot guide with him wherever he goes. Now we're hearing about a mask. Is there anything we need to know about your sex life? Army, I don't know how much we can put here without my parents being embarrassed, but I used to be like a dominant lover. I liked grabbing of the neck and the hair and all that, but you can't really pull your wife's hair. It gets to the point where you say, I respect you too much to do these things that I kind of want to do. My wife and I were supposed to go skeet shooting on our first date, but it started to rain, so we ended up going to a bunch of art galleries and then a porno store instead. As gratuitously expository as this interview may have been, it seemed that it was never Army's initial intention to pontificate on a sex life like this, and he regretted it in hindsight, chalking it up to having been drunk during the interview. His aversion to being a sex symbol was such that he mentioned he didn't even like being shirtless in movies, going as far as openly deriding the rumor that he was going to be cast as Christian Grey in Fifty Shades of Grey, calling it mommy for people to watch whilst they sit on top of the washing machine during the spin cycle. His words, not mine, but he's not really wrong. Unfortunately, Army's hindsight came a little too late, as on the very same day as his interview with Playboy was released, so was his conversation with a reporter from Elle. And though it wasn't as racy in theme, it contained similar information. In it, he mentions that before his marriage to Elizabeth, he spent about three years getting involved with women who were bad news, and one even tried to stab him during sex. While he does tell the story as if he didn't initiate it, he jokingly says that he only broke up with her seven months later. In a single single day, two stories came out that painted Army in the exact same way, and if we're about to get conspiratorial about it, it's quite likely that this, too, was orchestrated by him or people on his team in order to get some buzz around his name. 2014 rolls around and it seems Army is still professionally reeling it in from the underperforming of Lone Ranger while gearing up for another go at big feature films. Meanwhile, he and his wife of four years have their first child, a daughter by the name of Harper Grace. The only other significant event from this year takes place in November when Army, during a regular workout at his boxing gym, is jokingly invited into a sparring session by ex-NFL player Sean Merriman, and he accepts it. The thing is, Army didn't know he was an NFL player and presumed that, due to his size and weight, Sean was going to be slow. A sorely mistaken presumption. After catching Sean with a left hook, the session became a bit more real, resulting in a black eye, which according to Army, turned into the entire side of his face being swollen just a couple of days later. Like, right after, the, like two days later, the whole side of my face was swollen. It was ridiculous. But finally, the lull in his career would end, and another peak period begins. First, he co-stars in The Man from Uncle with Henry Cavill, followed by a series of well-performing, or at least well-received movies he either starred or took part in as a very prominent supporting role. From being a soldier stuck with his foot atop an explosive in mine, to being an unfaithful husband in Nocturnal Animals, all the way to being a slave owner in The Birth of a Nation, the roles he went for were consistently darker and riskier than he'd taken up until this point. Despite being one of, if not the busiest year in his entire career, 2016 was not the most successful. Plans to make The Man from Uncle into some kind of franchise fell through, and Birth of a Nation, which was angry to get an Oscar, quickly faded into obscurity and had lost all of its momentum by the time award season rolled around. Well, not just faded, it was absolutely destroyed and eclipsed by the 
allegations directed at the movie's writers, one of which was both the director and the lead role. More specifically, the allegations were made all the way back in 1999, but just as the movie's marketing rollout was at its peak and the hype for it superseded all of the competition, they resurfaced and completely obliterated the movie's energy. It's impossible to know how well the movie would have done if this hadn't happened, but it certainly would have been better. Ultimately, one of the accused was acquitted and the other was convicted, but the case was thrown out after the victim failed to testify. Regardless of that, the damage it did was irreversible. 2016 wasn't all bad though, as Army and his wife were expecting their second child, whom they named Ford. But Ford was born at the beginning of 2017, which happened to be much more fitting for the title of Army's most successful year. He was already well on the path to moving away from the big, theater-packing blockbusters and into the independent movie-making scene, which was not particularly surprising considering his bad experiences with large studio productions. However, some speculated that this was him hitting the reboot button after the failure of different avenues he went down while attempting to characterize himself as an actor. Regardless, he doubled down on said move, a decision that proved to be extremely wise. In January 2017, the Sundance Film Festival screened a film called Call Me By Your Name based on a novel of the same name. Much unlike The Lone Ranger's budget, which was miles north of $200 million, Call Me By Your Name had a $3 million budget, which if you're at all familiar with the kind of money that goes into making movies, definitely warrants being called humble. And unlike The Lone Ranger, it didn't just barely out-profit its costs, but exponentially surpassed it. It made $43 million, roughly 14 times the movie's cost. The success of the movie didn't just revive Army's career, but launched to the stratosphere that of his co-star, Timothy Chalamet, who at the time the movie came out was still relatively outside of the movie industry's sights. It's odd because Army at least seemed to be consistently trying to stay out of the box of doing romance movies, but I guess after enough failures, he gave in. However, Call Me By Your Name wasn't exactly a conventional romance movie, since the main plot involved the relationship of Oliver, a 24-year-old archaeologist played by Army, and Elio, a 17-year-old Jewish boy. Unsurprisingly, this found its way to controversy. Actor turned online political personality James Wood tweeted about the movie, claiming it was quietly chipping away at the last barriers of decency and compared it to NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association, an unfortunately very real thing that advocates for, I mean, I think the name says it all. Army replied, accusing Woods of dating a 19-year-old when he was 60, which was instantly corroborated by author and actress Amber Tamblin, who claimed James had attempted to pick her up when she was 16. Obviously, I'm not defending James in this situation, but it is kind of silly to deliberately overlook the glaring issue that the movie depicts a sexual relationship between an adult and a minor below the age of consent and act like the only thing people are criticizing is the age gap. Now that being said, I haven't seen this movie and I think it's okay for art to address complicated issues if it's done tastefully. So it's possible that the movie basically did this in a way that was to like, you know, not paint it as the best thing ever or prop it up as like the greatest thing of all time. It's possible that the movie did it in a way that they were, you know, shining light on the negative aspects of it. I don't know if that's the case. You guys can let me know in the comment section below. But regardless, the movie did get a lot of controversy from people who saw the idea of it and were like, this is kind of gross. This is kind of weird, uh, including, I guess, James Woods. Even though the debate wasn't entirely in Army or the movie's favor, especially considering that the accusations surrounding Kevin Spacey were just coming out at the time, Army's response went viral, and the controversy served to boost the movie's popularity further. All of this de facto success once again granted Army some leeway to be himself, including the parts people didn't like as much. In an interview he gave to The Hollywood Reporter, he revisited the drama surrounding Birth of a Nation, only to suggest there was a conspiracy at play, where the team behind one of the other movies competing for the 2017 Oscars went out of their way to release information on the case to take it out of the running. Additionally, he claimed there were double standards for the awards, saying, the director of Birth of a Nation had stuff in his past, which is heinous and tough to get beyond. I get that. But that was when he was 18, and now he's in director's jail. At the same time, the guy who went and won an Academy Award has three cases of sexual assault against him. He's referring to Casey Affleck, by the way, and the accusations of misconduct levied at him at the time. However, he later apologized for having done this, and it recognized the differences between the cases, but this wasn't his only blunder that year. Earlier on, he once again made the mistake of publicizing his sex life, this time by publicly liking BDSM related content on Twitter. A lot of the coverage alludes to him not knowing likes were public, but to be honest, I really doubt that's the case. Not only did Call Me By Your Name secure an Oscar, but ARMY closed 2017 off with a major participation in one of Disney's biggest releases that year, Cars 3. For a guy who claimed to be interested in increasingly indie productions and averted being a sex symbol, ARMY was kind of contradicting himself a lot. To great success, he was, you know, contradicting himself nicely. 2018 only saw a fraction of the success. Success. He was in three films, none of which were really box office hits, mostly due to their themes. One of them was a surrealist comedy, another was about terror attacks in India, and the third was a biopic of the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg. All in all, not really a shocker they didn't rake in the dough, but on the other hand, critics received them extremely well. In 2018, ARMY was also part of a Broadway show called Straight White Male, a predictably political and niched-in performance that didn't bring much to the table when it came to ARMY's career. If not another outright lull period, ARMY was mostly gliding off of Call Me By Your Name's after 
Afterglow, so much so that as the year's end approached, he began publicly speaking about how a sequel for it was confirmed, and there were already people working on it, presumably to keep some semblance of a hype train attached to his name going further and further. It wasn't until 2019 that ARMY's public perception began to actually deteriorate. First, there's the one and only theatrical release he has any involvement in in the entire year, a horror movie called Wounds, which was thoroughly panned for its nonsensical plot and terrible ending. Then, there's a bizarre video of ARMY's son, Ford, sucking his toes for seven minutes. You heard me right. I know kids do weird stuff, and you shouldn't punish them every time they do something abnormal, but filming your kid doing that and hashtagging it with foot fetish on fleek is something else. He wisely took the video down from Instagram, but people didn't forget and were rightfully disturbed by it. Still, none of this stopped him from proceeding with his usual media appearances. For the third time, rumors that he was being considered to play Batman surfaced, this time due to the floundering of Ben Affleck's performance, but according to ARMY, no one from Warner Brothers ever contacted him about it. No one yeah. brought that up to you because I heard Ben Affleck stepping down, yeah. and then your name was on like top of everyone's list to play. No one's asked. No one's talked to you about this. No, damn it. No. Wow. I, I, I mean, would, would you consider it? Yeah, of course. Like, who wouldn't want to be Batman? I think every guy in this audience would want to be <laughs> yeah. Batman if they could. The year was as uneventful as uneventful could get. He bought a home in Los Angeles, talked about having white privilege, and uh, drank goat milk directly from a goat's udder with Bear grills. All right, so it wasn't entirely uneventful, but still, so there's some <laughs> there's some weird stuff going on. 2020 was more of the same in terms of notoriety. Besides a short movie and an episode of a TV show, Army's one and only proper silver screen appearance was in a Netflix production titled Rebecca. The catch about it was that it was a remake of an Alfred Hitchcock film from 1940, which unsurprisingly drew a lot of unfair favorable comparisons from movie buffs. Ultimately, it wasn't well received, but it was not exactly poorly received either, ranging somewhere around forgettable or mediocre to audiences and critics alike. After the dud that was wounds, perhaps mediocrity was a step up, a transitionary state into doing headlining movies again, which many actors have gone through before. Army himself seemed pretty optimistic, tweeting out, 2021 is going to kneel down before me and kiss my feet, because this year, I'm the boss of my own year. Unfortunately, reality wasn't as optimistic as he was. After an unusually quiet 2020, as many people were due to the entire world screeching to a halt, a storm started brewing, the first sign of which was Elizabeth. Army's wife filed for divorce right around the same time Army began being seen with multiple different women. The separation was difficult to explain and very little was known about the situation. Within three months of the separation being announced, Army had to officially file for joint custody as Elizabeth was in the Cayman Islands and he hadn't seen the kids in eight months. Almost as soon as 2021 began, an Instagram account called House of Effie began to post multiple screenshots, claiming they were direct messages exchanged between Army and a woman he's supposedly been involved with since 2016. Just with this fact, everyone could already glean this meant Army's divorce was most likely caused by his infidelity, which in and of itself is already a big blow to your PR when you're like a goody two-shoes kind of actor guy, considering they'd been previously described as a power couple and things like that. However, in comparison to the rest of the info revealed, the truth was much, much darker than infidelity. Or should I say, the alleged truth. Dun dun dun! Dun dun dun! The sequence of stories began with a couple of screenshots of private stories sent directly from ARMY to this woman, containing an unforeseen image of a hand that, judging by the tattoo of its empty ring finger, was certainly ARMY's. These were prominently followed by a series of DM prints, which, though very elemental to the entire story, I'm compelled to abridge and heavily censor due to how graphic it very quickly gets. Over the course of multiple exchanges, ARMY begins by talking about how he wants to go to sleep while vampirizing her. No joke, that's, that's his opener like, 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 like a vampire. Then, presumably, when he doesn't get reprimanded for this insanity, he gets very bold and starts comparing this woman he's talking to to a deer he shot before proceeding to liver king the creature's heart. So he's into, like, being a vampire and, I guess, cannibalism or something. In this story, he says his friend also tried to take a bite of it, only to immediately throw up, whereas he continued to bite it relentlessly. He takes a quick break to talk about how the Netflix documentary Don't F*** With Cats made him titillated and said that while thinking about this girl, he absentmindedly started choking his dog. Between throwing around words like slave and describing how he wants to consume her entire anatomy bit by bit, he suggests to her the idea of keeping one of her toes as a trophy, in perhaps the most extremely disturbing moment of the conversation, though that's a very tight competition. Whilst walking with one of his kids, he tells the girl that he's right next to a ditch with some bushes and proceeds to tell her that this is the place he plans to R-word her. Now, obviously, this stuff could be chalked up a little bit 
little bit too fetishistic talk. If the person on the other end consented, you could say that, you know, if they both consent, I mean, what's the issue if they're getting into weird fetish stuff? I will say the don't fuck with cats thing is pretty insane. When the story broke, Bella Thorne, of all people, made statements saying, I honestly can't believe this. People are crazy to fake this kind of sh This poor guy and his kids, leave him and his family alone. No way he's a freaking cannibal. Also, there's a million fake screenshots going around, which is, a, I mean, that's a decent response if you don't know if they're real or, you know, there are fake screenshots, which there may have been some. That's possible. And to be clear, he's not an active cannibal as in like eating people. It's just like part of his, part of his fetish. Uh, yeah. Another story was uploaded, this time of Army choking himself in a selfie. Later posts claimed that the woman in question had begun contact with Army when they claimed to be just 17 years old, something Army allegedly knew and didn't care about as he initiated conversation immediately. These later posts also claimed that this woman named Effie and Army knew each other in real life in some fashion, and that was eventually concretely evidenced by a picture of them together. In one very important exchange in which they were discussing an intense bout of whatever it is Army was doing with this girl, he mentions that he was really worried if she truly wanted it to stop, to which she replied, I did truly want to stop for most of the time, ha 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 ha. He replied saying she took it like a champ, which she denied saying, no I didn't, I tried to crawl away and cried hysterically, I couldn't even look at you during any of it. That's how not ready I was. And all this response elicited from Army was, I'm not gonna lie, you crying and crawling away while I stalked you down your hallway was so exhilarating. <laughs> These look, these, uh, these don't read well. These don't, these don't read well. Once Effie's allegations came to light, the dam of silence surrounding Army's second life was broken, and flooding in came other women and claiming a variety of things, all of which either corroborated or added to the picture. Before I get into the response from Army and his team, I'll go over these women and their stories while trying to maintain a semblance of a timeline, however difficult that may be due to how poorly archived a lot of this info is. Also, just a reminder, again, I'm, I'm not technically legally obliged to say this, but I am personally legally obliged to say this. Um, um, these are all allegations. I'm simply documenting them as they've been presented. Take it with a grain of salt. And this is something everyone should heavily consider here. This all has to be taken with a big grain of salt because end of the day, uh, Army hasn't responded in depth to these really. And even beyond that, I mean, there could be a greater context for these conversations that would make them all look completely consensual. As for the girl being 17, don't know that. And there's a lot of other missing pieces of info that just make it kind of difficult to parse, right? So keep in mind, allegations, allegations, allegations. Despacito. Anyway, besides Effie, there was another girl whose online handle was Dominastia, Dominastia, with whom Army allegedly had an affair around 2017, though it seems it ended shortly after it began, and according to her, she was pressured into signing some kind of NDA. This also appears to be one of the first attempts to contact Elizabeth, Army's wife, to inform her of Army's lifestyle, though supposedly it wasn't effective as Elizabeth just didn't believe it. Another person who came forward was the creator of the Flashed app and Army's ex-girlfriend, Courtney Vusekovic, whom he dated from June to October 2020. She described him as someone who was charming from a distance, but instantly became sexually aggressive once given anything resembling a green light, explaining that he did what is called love bombing, meaning to overwhelm someone with affection in order to misdirect and distract them so they don't notice your designs on them. She showed a letter he sent to him in which he said he planned to bite her and claimed that he often talked about breaking her ribs, barbecuing and eating them, a specific kink that some connected the dots to with one of Effie's stories. She also described him as obsessive, sending her hundreds of texts and pressuring her into doing things she didn't want to do, all the while heavily drinking and doing drugs. Ultimately, Courtney checked herself into a 30-day partial hospitalization program for PTSD and trauma due to what happened with Army. Another of Army's recent exes, Paige Lorenz, shared that he carved the letter A into her crotch and intended to turn her into his pet. Once again, the themes of blood, biting, and cannibalism show up. Yet another woman whom he dated in late 2020, Jessica Siensen, also gave credence to these stories. These are just the publicly known women who spoke about Army, and there are many, many others who either messaged Effie's account with their own testimony or shared their experiences under an alias. Obviously, those are more dubious and have less proof, but it is worth noting. Ultimately, upon Effie's stories going viral, he stepped away from the projects he was working on at the time, saying, I'm not responding to these bullshit claims, but in light of the vicious and spurious online attacks against me, I cannot in good conscience now leave my children for four months to shoot a film in the Dominican Republic. Lionsgate is supporting me in this, and I'm grateful to them for that. He also acknowledged the allegations in a recording. They were very risque DMs. Uh, with someone who I was involved with in very much a sort of like um, kink-based relationship, if you will. Um, so a lot of shit was said that also most people don't relate to. It's kink, it's niche, it's fetish, right? So that's bad. Uh, and as, as if that wasn't bad enough... Think about this, you're having sex with someone and you say something to them in the heat of a moment when you're having sex. If someone else comes up to you and says, oh my God, I heard you said this to that person, 
like you said, out of the context, out of the heat of the moment, out of that safe place where it fucking sounds perfect to say, it's a little cringy. For a while, that was all the serious response there was from Army's end. A few days after the initial accusations, however, he's seen on video drinking and driving and licking white crystals off of somebody's hand. It's getting weird. <laughs> in another video, leaked from his private Instagram, El Destructo 86 a woman in lingerie is seen on all fours on Army's bed. He claimed this woman was Miss Cayman, as in the winner of a beauty pageant in the Cayman Islands, but later apologized for doing so and confirmed it wasn't her. Alright, so far so good. Uh, yeah, bed looks pretty comfy. That looks pretty good. Uh, oh, this must be the balcony. Cool. Yeah, boy. He also claims that his wife had already begun the process of divorce, saying, Divorce is so fun. Not as fun as drugs, but what is? On the topic of drugs, he also expressed his relief that DMT doesn't get picked up on the drug tests he's required to take in order to see his kids, though he admits to still having benzodiazepines and marijuana detected in his system. In the subtitle of one of the videos, he explained, My ex, for a very good reason, wife, is refusing to come back to America with my children, so I have to go back to Cayman which sucks. It's quite clear that along with the public at large discovering his lifestyle, his family completely falling apart caused him to go into a downward spiral, and he no longer cared about how bad all of this made him look. If his team was expecting the heat of the story to die down and eventually dissolve with time, Army ensured they would be sorely disappointed. As time went on, his scandal drew more and more eyes, until after Paige Lorenz's story, Army's lawyer released a statement, saying, These assertions about Mr. Hammer are patently untrue. Any interactions with this person, or any partner of his, were completely consensual and that they were fully discussed, agreed upon, and mutually participatory. The stories being perpetuated in the media are a misguided attempt to present a one-sided narrative with the goal of tarnishing Mr. Hammer's reputation, and communications from the individuals involved prove that. This statement was delivered with the expectation that it would soothe the issue, and again, it was wrong. Whether intentionally or otherwise, by releasing it, they inadvertently admitted that the messages were authentic, contrary to what Army initially claimed. In the following months, Army was dropped from everything he was a part of in the film industry, including his own agency, William Morris Endeavor. In March, Effie decided to take the next step with her allegations and outright accuse Army of raping her in 2017. According to her, he repeatedly slammed her head against a wall during the four-hour period in which the attack took place. She added, He also committed other acts of violence against me to which I did not consent. For example, he beat my feet with a crop so they would hurt with every step I took for the next week. During those four hours, I tried to get away, but he wouldn't let me. I thought that he was going to kill me. He then left with no concern for my well-being. Effie's lawyer, Gloria, then made the point that, though consent was initially given, it was limited to certain acts and not others, and eventually it was withdrawn altogether both facts which Army allegedly neglected. Army's lawyer, Andrew, denied any wrongdoing on Army's behalf, with his own evidence being messages that Effie hadn't shared on her Instagram stories, but that Army was able to provide. In them, Effie's messages are of an extremely sexual nature, to which Army replies with a refusal to engage, saying that he's no longer willing to do that. While this once again focuses on the existence of a consensual relationship, it still doesn't address the heart of the issue. On the contrary, it does exactly what they accused Effie of doing, cherry-picking some messages to make the other person look bad. Now, the investigation didn't lead to any kind of indictments or charges, but it also didn't help Army's reputation whatsoever. Effie's testimony also addressed her messages to him, saying the following, I tried so hard to justify his actions, even to the point of responding to him in a way that did not reflect my true feelings. During and since this attack, I've lived in fear of him, and for a long time, I tried to dismiss his actions towards me as a twisted form of love. Now that he no longer has any power over me, I've come to understand that the immense mental hold he had over me was incredibly damaging on so many levels. His abuse traumatized me to the point where, for months, I wasn't able to stop crying. I couldn't sleep or I'd have night terrors. I was constantly emotionally distressed and I lost interest in living. I couldn't comprehend and overcome what he had done to me. While initially very promising considering the sheer volume of accusations piling up in Army's vicinity, added to this was the fact that the messages were indeed his and his wife did divorce him in the wake of them coming out. However, as time slowly rolled on and no new developments happened in the story, things began to look more dire for the accusers. Around December 2021, the investigation of the LAPD into the allegations was all wrapped up and its findings were sent to the DA, though it was instantly clear that the case wasn't very strong and it didn't look like Army was going to be charged. Some people were at a loss as to why the case didn't move forward to trial because however it may have concluded, even if it ended up in a settlement of some kind, it may have given better closure than it simply perishing in DA hell. Eventually, it was revealed that contrary to the rumors that Effie had fired her lawyer and was planning to continue with another one, it was actually her lawyer, Gloria Allred, who decided she was no longer going to represent Effie after she refused to sign a declaration under perjury of her accusations, meaning she wasn't willing to swear under oath. Again, regardless of the veracity of these claims,
claims, if this is indeed the case, that's a huge blow to how all of the allegations are perceived when the person who spearheaded them isn't willing to sign a declaration under perjury. This came as even more of a shock when we take into account the fact that Elizabeth, who is now fighting for custody of her and Army's children, had been in contact with Effie and apparently was the one responsible for setting her up with her attorney. These screenshotted messages between them read as follows. I really need custody of my precious children. Do you think you could make a declaration this week? Stay focused on what you know and getting these stories on record, not just the internet. We just need statements and charges pressed. We need him to leave Cayman. He hasn't even seen the kids, having sex with everyone who walks around, taking a new blonde out on his dad's boat every day. He's truly a psychopath, and he's never been with the kids all day, ever. He almost always seems agitated with the kids. Their whole lives, he spent very little time with them and virtually none unsupervised. I forced him to come out here via court order to try to be a father, and now he's a risk to them. He needs to go. Had a few days with them, but then drunk or high or violent. He's hurting people here. He needs to be locked up. Again, I don't want to push you, but with your declaration, we can possibly get him locked up for the evaluation. I'm asking for the eval and scans. I don't trust he won't trick a therapist. The only visible response from Effie is her saying that she's feeling too to sign off on a declaration, which is not a vote of confidence for her trustworthiness, frankly. While these proceedings went on, Army checked into an inpatient facility for rehab in June 2021 for drug, alcohol, and sex issues. While we do have extensive information about his sex issues, we've only had glimpses of his problems with drugs and alcohol. People who were familiar with him went into detail about it, explaining that due to him being six foot five, he had a very high tolerance and would drink a bottle of vodka and not even feel it, saying there's not a drug he won't do. One of his ex-girlfriends also called him doing acid to play golf and on the same day drinking eight beers and four martinis right before going on a 17 hour long bout of drunk driving only to have an argument with her. Someone who worked on the same set as him during the shooting of Lone Ranger described the actor as having a stockpile of joints in his trailer as well as mixing alcohol with pain medication saying he likes to get hammered on whatever drug is around him and go driving incredibly fast throughout the city like 140 miles an hour down residential streets which is terrifying. Damn so you're telling me that Army Hammer likes to get Hammered. Oh shit! Oh shit! Oh. We're so fing back. We are so freaking back right now. Regarding him going to rehab, Effie said, well, I'm glad that Army is finally getting the help I begged him to get for so long. This does not take away all of the immense pain and suffering he has caused me. While that may sound unforgiving, I think it's justified given what Army had allegedly done to her, but we don't really know if it's true, to be honest. Besides, there's at least a chance going to rehab was simply Army angling to either get back into Elizabeth's good graces or to make himself look more fit to retain his children's custody. After all, when he was going to rehab, he reached out directly to Elizabeth and asked her for help seeking treatment a request she complied with as she was the one who dropped him off at the facility in Florida. Regardless, it was clear she didn't consider this sufficiently contrite in order to give him access to the kids. He checked out in December, six months after his check-in, around the same time the investigation on him for Effie's accusations came to an end. Besides the movie Crisis, which came out just briefly after the allegations surfaced, Army hadn't done any work that entire year, and given both the legal costs of the divorce and what he presumably spent impulsively during his meltdown, rumors began spreading out that the actor was running out of money. As of early 2017, Army himself had been hinting at his finances being unusually tight for an actor, which gave credence to this rumor. His six-month stay at the rehab facility wasn't paid for by his own money, but by fellow actor Robert Downey Jr., who, due to having gone through rehab himself, saw an opportunity to be charitable. Another rumor was that there was some kind of reconciliation and getting back together going on between him and Elizabeth, though it was made clear that they were simply doing their best to co-parent after the efforts to have him charged with something and lose custody fell through. While this rumor was proved to be untrue, Army was indeed financially bereft and since he could no longer exercise his profession as an actor, he took up work as a timeshare salesman, managing an apartment complex at a hotel in the Cayman Islands. The source which provided this information said, he's working at the resort and selling timeshares. He's working in a cubicle. The reality is he's totally broke and is trying to fill the days and earn money to support his family. It's a, it's, it's, it's a pretty sad reality out here, guys. If that's true, I don't know. Almost, almost feel bad for the guy. You know, if all that stuff isn't true, Jesus. While Army was apparently trying to make ends meet in the Caymans, a documentary miniseries about his misdeeds called called House of Hammer was being cobbled together by Discovery Plus, set to come out in September. The rollout for it created some big expectations, especially since it was revealed shortly after by a representative of the LADA that the case was either never closed or had never been reopened, as it was still under investigation actively. However, when it came out, this documentary was not all it was cracked up to be. First off, they failed to get Effie to even be in it, opting instead to have her lawyer do it, which obviously the information she could offer was much more limited, especially since he no longer had any ties with Effie to speak of. Of. This glaring absence was filled in not just by other ex-girlfriends of armies who had much milder experiences with the man, but also by his aunt. My name is Casey Hammer, and I'm about to reveal 
the dark, twisted secrets of the Hammer family. The only issue with that is that his aunt only really knew him when he was a child, so she can't add much to the story. Unsurprisingly, the focus shifted towards the less important and more unreliable aspects of Army's scandal. And that's just the first problem with the docuseries, as they spent a large portion of the runtime covering general dirt from the Hammer family, going back five generations. Given, the Hammer family is pretty interesting, but since Army's face is featured front and center on the poster, it's a bit of a stretch to have two whole episodes of this three-episode series not even be about Army. One of the things Army was described doing when initiating his relationships with a few of his ex-girlfriends is doing precisely what this show does, starting going into how dysfunctional and bizarre his family was, almost as if to exculpate himself. What's worse is that due to a lot of information about Army's family being old, it gets increasingly difficult to verify it to any extent, so to even include a lot of the info beyond like bare bones stuff, as if it were related to the main topic at hand, is not a super smart decision. Obviously, I talked about his family in this video because it's an important part of his past, but the video is really about Army Hammer. I feel like the framing of the documentary is kind of disingenuous, and beyond that, I mean, there's just so many issues. This thing is just, it's kind of a mess. Besides this involuntary media depiction, somehow a movie came out in 2022 that had Army Hammer acting in it, though he was conspicuously missing from the marketing for it for obvious reasons. If this release made him any money, apparently it wasn't nearly enough, since by October of that same year, he was seen in LA looking somewhat disheveled for his usual standards. Right around the same time, information was coming out about him being sued by American Express over nearly $70,000 worth of debt. Wait, is he debt maxing? Absolutely f***ing based. American Express, I owe you over 2000 Even if I had it, you're never getting it back. On perhaps a more positive note, he appeared to be more fit to be a parent for his kids, so much so that Elizabeth's stance on him transformed into a more positive one, even if cautiously so. She said, We are in a really great place. We talk all the time, we're committed fully and wholly to our children, and to being together as much as possible in a non-romantic way for our kids. Kids need their mom, kids need their dad. So there's nothing we won't do. Army has been focused on his healing. People are flawed, people make horrible mistakes, people change, by the way. Elizabeth was trying to make the best out of an absurd situation, and at that point in time, was already even seeing someone else. As for Army himself, in late 2022, he was still very much persona non grata in Hollywood, but doors slowly began opening back up as the heat of his 2021 situation died down. For example, the director of Call Me By Your Name suggested that, were a sequel to happen, Army would have to be in it regardless of the allegations. It's strange because one of the projects Luca had recently worked on also involved Timothy Chalamet, a movie called Bones and All is, is the name of the movie. The reason it's strange is because Bones and All is a romance movie about cannibalism, <laughs> although he claimed it had nothing to do with Army which is probably, I mean, definitely 1000% true. I mean, it's just kind of a funny name. Other than his stepmom filing a $2 million lawsuit against Army's brother over inheritance issues, January 2023 was a relatively calm month. February, on the other hand, started with the first interview Army had done in years. In it, he claimed that the alleged 2017 attack was a scene the two had meticulously planned out over Facebook Messenger and that it was Effie's idea. He also said that his affair with Effie was exclusively sexual and ended as early as summer 2017 and again claimed that she was the one who continuously tried to get him to leave his wife, even threatening to reveal their affair in order to persuade him. In order to prevent Elizabeth from hearing about this, Army told her in advance, and the two somehow managed to work it out for the time being. In response to these claims, Effie made another series of Instagram stories, showing that the writer of the article didn't contact her, and that Army had apparently lied about the affair being purely sexual, with screenshots that showed him declaring his love for her. Notwithstanding, she also shows multiple screenshots of evidence that she was the one who broke the affair up first, and he tried to relentlessly restart it. She even showed proof that upon her beginning a relationship with someone else in August 2017, Army became very frustrated and depressed about no longer having access to her. Other receipts show that he was the one who brought up the topic of playing out a scene, and in a strange and seemingly random bout of deliberate misinformation, he'd lied about Effie being an employee of some kind at a sex club? They called it a dungeon, but I'm not exactly sure what that means, though it definitely doesn't sound good. If this sounds a bit more one-sided for Effie, it's because it is. As far as the information available goes, she's the only one showing prints of their conversations. Many of Army's claims have no backing besides his word. At a moment in the interview, he claims he has no interest in suing Effie for retribution because it would blow up the situation again, but Effie raises the point that it's because if the case went to trial, the messages would have to be verified in their entirety, something he didn't want happening. Army claimed the reason he didn't share screenshots to prove things he says and exonerate himself is because they've since been deleted, and he's tried to subpoena Meta but didn't have success. However, given the extreme degree of things we've seen in screenshotted messages that were kind of proven to be true, 
I don't think complete exoneration is possible to any extent. In another moment, Army brings up that he'd been molested in his youth by a pastor and that it set a dangerous precedent in his life. Due to his feeling that he was not in control of the situation at the time, he later became obsessed with being the one in control. While it's not entirely surprising that this is the case, considering the majority of people with issues like Army's tend to have been sexually victimized somehow, it doesn't justify the things he allegedly did. And keep in mind, this is still alleged and Effie refusing to sign that, you know, a perjury thing, kind of big. As was pointed out by one of Effie's stories, Army was prone to doing whatever he could to garner people's sympathy. One example is a story he told not just to Effie, but to Courtney and even the air mail interviewer about him feeling so bad that he swam out really far in the ocean, suggesting he was putting his own life at risk. Of course, when and in what context this supposedly happened changed on who he was telling the story to. He also revealed he lost around $15 million through 2021, as many people had estimated. His lawyer also claimed that he had pictures of Army when the supposed attack happened that proved he was somewhere else, though when requested for the photos, he didn't provide them. It's worth noting that Effie also features some stories pointing out that the owner of Air Mail, who hosted the interview with Army, was the same guy who was editor-in-chief of Vanity Fair and refused to publish the stories of Epstein's 16-year-old victim when that was going down and was pictured hugging Ghislaine Maxwell. The interview concluded with Army musing about how people have grown too unforgiving of other struggles, and perhaps for an untrained eye, this may look like Army is taking the high road here, especially since the case involving Effie's allegations was finally truly closed with no charges being pressed by May 2023. However, in the same month the interview came out, three months before Effie's case got closed, an unrelated 26-year-old woman accused Army of choking her unconscious against her will during sex and was granted a temporary restraining order. She added that he was under the influence of molly, alcohol, and ketamine during it. When it came time for this particular matter to be tried, the accuser didn't show up for trial. However, Army also didn't show up, almost as if he expected the accuser not to show up either. It's not uncommon for celebrities to get caught up in the lifestyle of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's why every rap song is about just that. And so, on that front, to condemn Army for sleeping around or to condemn him for his infidelity is a little ludicrous. Like, I I mean, it sucks he cheated on his wife, but I don't really fucking care. Like, whatever. We just don't know him. We can't be that parasocially angry at him for that. I'm not his wife, so I don't have a lot of personal investment in if he's loyal to her or not. And while his sexting is very strange, I think if he and a consenting woman want to discuss cooking some she-ribs up on the George Foreman, I don't really see a problem. The problem comes if the allegations by Effie and others are credible. But from the outside looking in, we truly cannot know. No, unless he's officially charged or convicted, which he has not been. So why is the story of Army Hammers ultimately inconclusive? Well, it's because in the eyes of the law, he's completely innocent. And there's not much more you can say other than, uh, I like the social network. I'm not coming back for half. I'm coming back for everything. I've been Turkey Tom. I mean, I've been Tom Dark. And uh, I appreciate you guys watching this video all the way to the end. Leave a like if you liked it. Leave a dislike if you disliked it. Leave a comment down below with your thoughts. Uh, watch all my other stuff. Follow my Twitter at Anon Bird, actually my friend's Twitter, someone else that represents me, my manager, my hot female assistant. Check out my Instagram, which is Tom But Dark. My hot female assistant, my other hot female assistant manages that actually. And I I, I, uh, I eat her ribs too. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, I said thank you, bye. Just, just, fucking, just leave, leave me alone. He said it. He said the thing! And be sure to become a member. For $5 a month, they get the members only podcasts and exclusive videos that only members get. Thanks so much for your support. No